can say definitively that religions are all bullshit. Welcome to Brainstorm. We have the explicit tag for a reason. This is a base level argument to a higher level morality. I get paid to science? To science as much as one can science. What the hell was my point? Trigger warning. The Brainstorm podcast will criticize your most cherished beliefs. We attack nonsense in all its forms and discuss difficult subjects. To those listening live or to our patrons, welcome back. For those listening weekly, welcome to the Shift to Reason Radio, the brainstorm production that tries to educate and inform. We'll take current events and important skeptical topics and try to analyze them critically. Remember, we're live on Spreaker.com every second Friday, and today is September 29th, 2017. I'm still joined by Destin. Hey. Renee. Hello. Angela. Hello. Bassett. What's up? And our guest host, Idella. Hi. And the always amazing Dave doing sound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So uh, we may as well jump right into some religious nuttery. Yes, please. Cornerstone, this might be new to some of you. Scripture says that even our righteous deeds are as filthy rags to God. So even the good things that you do, even things like feeding, feeding the hungry and, and clothing the poor, and taking in widows and orphans, as nice as those things are, if not done from the place of obedience to in a relationship with God, are completely worthless and disgusting to God. If you're not daily walking in a place of relationship to God, then the news that we have to bring you is that you're on your way to hell right now. <laughs> I've heard that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a dick. What a dick. Yeah. We uh, mm-hmm. we pulled that from the Christ Core documentary on uh, the hardcore Christian Christian hardcore scene. What's his name? I cannot remember. I've definitely heard him. I've heard that <laughs> line before. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Gumby. What do you got for us? All right. So the irrationality of AA. Oh, geez. You're gonna attack Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, I would. I've always wanted to attack AA. Enlighten us. Well, yeah. first off, it's a uh, it's a twelve step program. If everybody is not familiar with it, it's actually based around um, belief, and it's it's been debunked countless times by different groups, by doctors. Um, the article that Corey's going to post up is called "The Irish- Irrationality of AA." Or, um, <clears throat> Basically, a story about a guy named J.G. Um, He's a lawyer in his early 30s. Um, He started drinking when he was 15 years old and favored gin and whiskey and then started drinking beer and whatever he can get. Um, And he used alcohol as a way to cope with a very active mind. Like It's the only thing that can calm him down. Interesting. And during college, his his drinking increased. Uh, Once he started practicing as an attorney, he was drinking over a liter of Jameson in a day. But he managed Mm -hmm. to get his law degree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. (laughs) That was after he got his degree. While he was practicing, every day, he was drinking a liter of Jameson, which is whiskey. Right. For people that don't know. Um, he started in 2012 to get help. He lived in Minnesota, the land of 10,000 rehabs, <laughs> what the people call it. And um, what he found out is like, he tried to dedicate himself to the program, but as an atheist, he was really put off by the faith, faith-based approach of it. Um, five of the different steps actually mentioned God. Right. Um, and everybody warned him that he had a chronic progressive disease, which he didn't believe. He just thought that he drank too much. Right. Um, and that's the message that there are no small mes- missteps, that one drink might as well be 100. Like, it's it's all about the wagon, right? As soon as you fall off the wagon, you're done. And that you can't, you have to be cold turkey forever. Yeah. 
So th- this thing is 27 pages long. There's a ton of stuff in here. I right. really recommend reading it. But basically what it breaks down to is that AA um, claims a 75% success rate. Right. Which can't be proven because it's anonymous. Right. And it's not centralized. There's um, when it was when it was first when it first came out um, there is uh, sorry there's an off-sided study from 1996 um, founded as a form of individual therapy that aims to get the patients to attend AA meetings um, as effective as cognitive behavior therapy and motivational interviewing so that that's all it is right there's there's no actual therapy involved in AA there's nothing that's actually beneficial right, right, to somebody yeah, that's trying to quit. Just quit, and we have this person that'll kind of try to help you. Um, the AA truisms have so infiltrated our culture that many people believe heavy drinkers cannot recover from there before they hit bottom. Uh, it's like they say it's akin to offering antidepressants only to people who have attempted suicide or prescribing insulin only after a patient has lapsed into a diabetic coma. And fully 12% of people that are in the program are doing it because of DUIs and they're being forced to do it by judges. Um, And that's not to demonize AA. AA has helped millions of people, but uh, it's just, it's it's a bullshit religious-based indoctrinization thing that is more harmful, does more harm than good. And it's not just AA, it's, um, there's, there's two facets to AA. There's Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. And then there's uh, the support group for AA. And it's just as bad. You go to meetings, the exact same. And it's for uh, like the wives or the husbands or the kids of people that are alcoholics. And it's it's just just as harmful. I uh, I once uh, knew a person who who had a parent in AA, and they they went to Al Anon. I think that's the family one, Al Anon. Yeah. And they uh, they expressed uh, some things that they had learned there, like that if they ever drank, then they would be an alcoholic in it automatically. Mm-hmm. And that always struck me as incredibly uh, nonsensical. Like, of course, a person who has never had a drink in their whole life doesn't automatically become an alcoholic because they have a drink. That's right. <laughs> and I mean... It seemed like that was a pretty harmful message from my perspective at the time. Yeah, I think that's harmful, especially to young people, yeah, because it, that makes them want to rebel and go the opposite <laughs> way. Well, and, and what this guy did is he yo-yoed because he'd, he'd fall off the bandwagon and have one drink because he couldn't sleep because he was constantly anxious. Right. Like just, his anxiety was ridiculous. So he'd have one drink and then he's like, well, I'm fucked. Yeah, mm. I've fallen right. off the wagon. I might as well just get hammered for the net for as much as I can. And then he'd get drunk for three weeks and Jeez. go back on and off. Right? Yeah, I know lots of people that used to be alcoholics, or people like me that tried to become one. Right, <laughs> and it's it's not a disease. Everybody says it's a disease. It's not. It's just an addiction, and you can get over an addiction. It's it's shitty. It's hard. It's 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 really tough. And it's easy to relapse, but there's people that have quit being alcoholics that can still go and drink. Are there not, uh, like, as time has progressed, are there not more evidence-based type uh, programs that can help people? There are quite a few others. There's tons of other programs. Um, They're now theorizing that giving an alcoholic small amounts of alcohol is one of the better ways to help with their addiction because like every hour or every like few hours come in i'll give you 12 ounces of beer and then go on your way um that's something that they're they're working on on figuring out if that's more effective right it's it's kind of in progress type yeah because and i listened to a program recently where they're trying to use the model of Alcoholics Anonymous on f- food addiction. Now, the... the on existing, food addiction? Oh, oh, wait. The Overeaters Anonymous yeah. is a thing, but there's also people, like, there's an inpatient 
treatment program where you go and you're, you know, having me, you're, you're in the same place as people that are addicted to heroin or alcohol and you're, you're just, you know, you ate 40 chocolate bars yesterday. So it's interesting. I, I, Mm, that concerns me. The only similarity yeah. is like impulse control is, is kind of similar. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. The thing about AA is it was founded in 1935 when we knew nothing about brain chemistry or addiction and none of the tenets have changed. Right. Because there's no difference in the validity of AA uh, as compared to fucking acupuncture or um, chiropractic. There's, <laughs> it's, it's the same. It's all woo. I don't know. I find it funny because I was just li- like as posted this article. I just finished listening to the uh, Dave Mustaine of Megadeth autobiography. Oh, yeah. And that's a man that's been through rehab 17 times. Right. <laughs> I think he's got a couple named after him. Actually. Uh, I, I'm, he's probably paid enough to buy at least one. But it's kind of it's kind of it's a weird thing, like the way he described going to these different addictions, because like there's a point where he. He just knew. He just knew the knew the routine. Where he's just like, "Oh, you're sending me off to rehab. Well, let's go get really fucked up before we go in and dry out." You know, <laughs> and like, Ed, but the weird the weird pattern with it is <laughs> is that um, with the addiction is a lot of them just substitute a different addiction. Like yeah. I know in the case of Dave Mustaine, he's now become this you know fairly born again Christian. And you know, as a, as I found out in the book, a part of that is because his wife was apparently quite the. Oh, it, it's all right. And it's kind of like, you know, and you know, in a way, good for him. It, it's work. It's worked for him. He's now clean, where he used to like just do mountains of shit. But Alice Cooper is the same way. Like he used to be a raging alcoholic, and he substituted golf. Right. Mm-hmm. Now he's he's got a handicap that you know some pro golfers would be, <laughs> you know jealous of but yeah. you know they're just substituting one obsession for another you know i don't know if there's if that's any it's, healthier yeah right <laughs> well, I'm golf curious. is probably healthier than than coke i guess yeah. i guess yeah yeah Slightly. Think, so. <laughs> not so for the so, environment yeah. yeah so what did you do today <laughs> well, wait, i did 26 <laughs> rounds of golf well i guess it's better than 26 lines of coke you know but yeah I, i'm curious what dave thinks <laughs> uh, w- w- about what specifically, though? Oh, well, about a. <laughs> well, I know, I know I've talked about it on the show before. Yeah, because um, I, you know, I've worked in the field. I, I wasn't, I was in AA for many years, so I know, I know the routine. Um, w- one thing I do want to mention about the disease model, um, like I think it, it is starting to become obsolete within the addictions world slowly, but I do think the initial intention of it was fine. Um, like initially, the help. The, initially, what they're trying to do is is give it a medical, more of a medical condition kind of uh, okay. vibe. Because I think you know before, it, it's to reduce the stigma that people had for pe- for alcoholism. So it wasn't addiction. blaming the individual. It, exactly. That that was the initial intent of that idea that they wanted to treat it like a disease, okay. where it was something that it was it needed to be treated. It wasn't it wasn't like you were a terrible human being. So I mean, I do like that part of it. Um, it's not. It's not accurate in terms of what it's saying, but, and, and I mean, we're past that now. I mean, we're at the point now where uh, being an alcoholic is a very, like, mainstream term. And it's like, if, I, if, you say, if you say to somebody, hey, yeah, no, I'm going to AA now, they don't go like, oh, you're, you're fucking terrible. Like, <laughs> right. you know, like, usually people give you a pat on the back and say, well, good for you, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that, that mentality has changed within society. Like, we're, we're more willing to give those kinds of options to people for help. Mm-hmm. Which, which I like. Um, but now what's happening is, I mean, uh, harm reduction is becoming, you know, a, a method that we're starting to understand more. Right. And uh, there's a lot of harm reduction initiatives. Vancouver, like BC in general, is kind of the leader in that, I find, in yeah. Canada. Yeah. Uh, when I was there, uh, I actually got to uh, talk to a lot of people involved in that stuff when I was there last time. And um, th- i talking about, like, these, these uh, dr- um Harm reduction alcohol uh, residences, that's something that actually does exist. Where, mm-hmm. Okay. Where they have, like, a residence for people who are, like, you know, like ex- maybe they're um, extremely at risk for homelessness and all kinds of things. And um, one of the biggest things is that for a long time we've attached uh, social services to sobriety. So, for instance, like, you want to have a place to live, 
<laughs> you you need to be sober. Yeah. That's uh, and, that still goes on quite a bit. Well, not as much. Okay, it's, it's actually happening less and less. Um, so I mean, their philosophy in 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 these kinds of places is that people would come, and they would have an actual dosage of alcohol they were allowed to have, and you know they had to come to the place to do that, and then they could you know like like they were they were allowed a certain amount, mm-hmm. and what they find is that. Um, those people are actually more willing to stick around the shelter and, or not the shelter, I guess the residents, okay. um, and, and actually continue in residence programming and other things with that incentive. So some effectiveness there. I think it's still very uh, premature in some ways. Like there's still a lot to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, actually our general approach now to, to housing in Canada is way better than it ever was. Um, we we don't housing first is the is the most uh, is the big movement right now which isn't perfect but ultimately now our philosophy is you give you give shelter first okay um, with no no attachment you don't have to attend this programming you don't have to do this thing you don't have to do that thing you are entitled to shelter um, you, you're entitled to a place to live and 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 then you get them in that place to live and then you start helping them work on things so. Like like the what do they call it the hierarchy of needs kind of idea? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, um, so that that's kind of the philosophy that is actually prevailing now in North actually North America, not even just Canada. Uh, it came from the states. Um, so so having said that, there is some progress, is what I'm saying. Um, I think we're, we're we're viewing the issue as different. It's not it's not so much about uh, a disease as much as it is about okay. Well, there's obviously like a mental health issue or there's something going on. And and we need to start from the bottom up. Like we need to start rebuilding your life, giving you giving you like health too, right? Like come to a safe injection site. Um, we'll, we'll have nurses there. We'll we'll make sure it's safe. We'll right. make sure you don't overdose. So it's uh, yeah yeah. Then you try to find the root of situations like socioeconomical things. Yeah. And, and, well, the reality is some of these people will never get out of that situation. I mean, the reality is that they might be addicted to heroin the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. But at the very least, we can give them some quality of life. Yeah. Right. And we can also, you know, if you want to speak from conservative economic terms, and, and they actually will buy into this, um, you know, at the same time, you're saving money because you're taking money away from law enforcement, uh, your money, yeah. money away from like uh, hospitals, things like that. And we have that right here in our, in our own province. Um, you know, in, in Regina, they're they're really leading the way and starting to do some of that. Where improved incarceration, incarceration yes. rates. Yes. Well, medicine had did it first. Well, yeah, that mayor is a little bit out to lunch sometimes. But anyway, I, 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 met, I, met, I met him and spoke to him. Yeah. It, was, it was interesting. Uh, no, no, but at least, at least they, they, they did it. Well, right? yeah, they've adopted housing first. Yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, I mean, their problem is much different than <laughs> like Toronto or Montreal or something like that. But mm-hmm. anyway, so that, those are some of my thoughts. I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not completely against the idea of people getting together and having like a common purpose. I think that part can be beneficial for some, right? Um, but but yeah, in terms of them claiming some of the things they do, like it, it's way out there. It's well, and, and people I know that have gone through the program that have family, um, they they go through the program, and everybody that they've hurt in their family, they're like, well, you know, it wasn't in my control. So and that's that's their past. They just have a past, and they um, uh, they're supposed to apologize and seek forgiveness, but um, a lot of them get addicted to a meeting. They get addicted to the program. Hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, tit for tat. Yeah. I'd probably prefer they're addicted to the program, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> not if it's not solving problems at home, though. Well, and that's a different story, right? And and that's where there's a lot more, like, underlying work to yeah. do. And AA does nothing to help with that stuff, really. It, it, it claims to, but, yeah, it's, it's not great at it, no. I wanted to mention there's a book about this exact topic, topic called The Biology of Desire by Mark Lewis, why, I, why addiction is not a disease. It's something that I've had on my to-read list for a long time. Interesting. Interesting. And it just talks, he's a neuroscientist who explains why the disease model of addiction is wrong and illuminates the path to recovery. So, I mean, it would be an interesting um, thing to, to look into. I think we could ask uh, Steve Novella if we have him on the show again. Oh, yeah. I might have all of next year already figured out. Okay. <laughs> wow. All of next year. <laughs> Maybe. Really? Well, we only have every second week, right? So it's, it's only 26. 26 yeah. yeah. Well, Bi-weekly. Yeah, I guess Bi-weekly. so. Yeah, you know. <laughs> wow. Good work. <laughs> That's impressive, Corey. 
well, we'll see how it goes. But all right, any final thoughts, Gumby? I usually don't have any thoughts. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. You had lots. Nicely done. <laughs> Angela, what do you got for us? So my story this week was uh, a, j- a journalist said, I'm no longer an atheist because I'm not a negative person. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my God. Because mm. we're all just the worst. We're fucking terrible. Actually, we're pessimists. Some well, most atheists, atheists, are, atheists, are, some atheists are the worst. The, the, the loudest <laughs> ones are. <laughs> yeah. So a woman by the name of Sally Quinn, she's a longtime journalist and oh, author. Oh, fuck Sally Quinn. I don't want to. No. I don't want to. <laughs> so she, she is a founding editor of a site called On Faith. Okay. Um, it's a site full of religious opinions, essays, and it used to be hosted at the Washington Post. Who's your husband? Um, her husband is Ben Bradley. Didn't he have something to He's do with spearheaded Watergate? Watergate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so she okay. basically. Sorry. The reason she's in the in the media is she wrote a book called Finding Magic, a spiritual memoir. Yeah, she's crazy. Ooh, la, la. Yes. I'm nuts. Yes. So she she had a She found the magic. Yeah. Yeah. So she <laughs> she's got egg. a history of insulting <laughs> atheists. She painted all atheists with the same nasty hater color of paint. <laughs> she was on Morning Joe on September eighteenth when in the video, I don't know if any of you watched it, but it was it was interesting. They didn't talk much about her book. Um, so, the her f- fellow founding editor of the On Faith website, John Meacham, apparently led her away from atheism because he insulted atheists. Oh, I see. He said atheism is a negative word, and he gave her a long list of books to read. Um, and she, okay. she basically says that angry atheist doesn't make sense. You still have to be, leave in God to be angry at him. Um, she doesn't <laughs> understand what angry atheists are angry about then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so her story, like she was a, an atheist for quite a long time. She became an atheist because her father told her about his World War II experience. And she basically at a young age found his think of some photographs or something and he honestly told her about the horrors of war and um that basically was like well if god's gonna let something like this happen she's like fuck that shit so she was smarter as a kid than she is now yes impressive yeah interesting and and now (laughs) she believes that that all religion is magic whatever you believe has to be taken on faith right and you have to believe it to see it why not? Um, <laughs> she she and, and she goes on to say she's not necessarily a Christian. She's a transcendentalist. <laughs> she believes in magic and miracles. <laughs> she believes in magical and magic and miracles, and she believes in quote unquote divine and finding meaning in life and taking care of people. And she said exactly in the video. She's cherry picked different things from different religions. She read all of these books and she was like, mm, I like that. I like that. I like that. So, like any religion. Yeah. The funny thing is, you can do that as an atheist and not totally. believe in God. Totally. <laughs> and it's funny because I found some things. Like she said, love is the only way toward happiness. And taking, caring pe- taking care of people is one of her, the most important things for her in life. And I was like, that's weird. That's how I feel. Like taking yeah. care of the people I love. That's that's how I feel. That's interesting, but, you know, you're an atheist, so that can't be true. It can't be true because I'm super negative. Mm. Well, because atheists want to argue with everyone. That's right. And, well, she's just... Well, some of us, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It depends on the day As you're arguing with me. (laughs) 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 You're wrong. Well, I said some of us. Hinted. That includes sometimes, me. Yeah. Sometimes I'm all fired up and ready to fight, but not every day. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just want a hug and a bag of chips. Mm-hmm. That's that's it. I have a question. So, in a way, can we say she has a point? And uh, a while ago, uh, Corey had posted something. Maybe it was even last week. I can't remember. Basically, it's like how conspiracy theorists have to believe in a conspiracy because they cannot accept the truth and is that people are awful. So in this case, 
<laughs> that sounds like something I'd post. Yeah. And in this case, you, you know, she, when her dad was telling her about the World War stories and uh, she decided to become atheist because the truth is war is awful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we all agree on that. Mm-hmm. So that being said here, where people who want to seek evidence, want to seek the truth, and with that comes a lot of questioning, and the truth is not very pretty. You know, we, we not have to, always no. No, and for me, in my experience, most of the truth is ugly. Like it's scary. So, you know, you go from the idea of thinking you're going to go to heaven to, you know, avoiding hell to the idea of like now you're simply going to die, and nothing's going to happen to the idea of accepting. Hey, that's okay, and you know, more preferable right. than hell, personally speaking. <laughs> So when we go ahead and argue uh, to tell someone that, you know, we're seeking the truth and we're telling them the truth not pretty versus the fantasy fairy land they've built from themselves, are we not always going to be perceived as a negative? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in <laughs> Every a way, single time. Yeah. In a way, like, for example, Athea for me and the concept of love and there being the perfect one out there for you. Of course, being an atheist, I don't believe in that at all. Mm-hmm. I think you can be compatible with many different people, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Maths. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Gumby is showing me that John Meacham is a very well-known journalist. He's actually, uh, he's the executive editor and executive vice president at Random House, oh. contributing editor at Time Magazine, uh, former editor and chief, chief of Newsweek. He's a mm. Christian. And he's a super right. Christian. So that's why... Some things might have a slant in that There's direction, or maybe that's how somebody got a book published. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I knew that name sounded familiar. So that's right. When it comes to negativity, would you say it's just a matter of perspective? Because we're we don't think we're negative by finding the truth. Well, Speak for yourself. We're in our own, we're in our own little Christ. echo <laughs> chamber in here. Yeah. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. I had a. Yeah debate shall we say at work one day where say you know kind of came out that yeah non-believer and one guy he's well a pseudo question shall we say he's right. like, oh i think it's it's you know i think it's sad when you don't believe in something and i'm like well fuck why why do you why do <laughs> yeah. you need to believe in yeah why does world? that need to make you happy yeah. I don't well no feel a, sad. A, a, non, <laughs> yeah. a non-position isn't a negative position exactly <laughs> And I was, I was, I was ready to go with like, I mean, if you want to have that fight, we could have that fight. (laughs) That's right. It was the most silent I've ever seen that guy for about an hour. (laughs) It was actually kind of pleasant because usually he's running his mouth off, but you know, like, but that's, but that, but that's where that, I think where that perception is, is because people, there's that idea that, well, you don't have to be a Christian, but you have to believe in something. Well, find the Easter Bunny. Fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I think there is the perception that we're negative because we don't. We try not to abide bullshit. And I think I think when you're indoctrinated in in one way or the other, whether it's organized religion or conspiracy theories, you have that that cozy blanket of bullshit. Mm-hmm. And and atheists, skeptics, whatever, they are often thought of negatively because it's like you do realize there's no tooth fairy well we refuse to cherry pick we just accept what it is as much as possible i mean and and granted i'm learning that the atheist community Mm. nobody's perfect nobody's perfect there's so many people in that group that Mm -hmm. the one constant is people are assholes yes yeah that's right yeah well, people seem to have this belief that just because it might make them feel good, that means it can be true. Like, mm-hmm. that's synonymous with truth, which isn't false. Like, you can feel good praying, you can feel good singing a hymn, but that doesn't mean it's doing anything. Yeah. yeah. So I guess yes. maybe that's how we get perceived as negative, by taking that away from them or whatever, yeah. which we're not really trying to do. No. But. Well, people have always been told to go seek their own personal truth, which there's no such thing. Yeah. There's truth and not truth. But if it's true for me, then it must be true. I said thoughts and prayers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
Why the, is it Puerto Rico trips. all better? Yeah. There were so <laughs> many thoughts and prayers. <laughs> Why won't you take my thoughts and prayers? <laughs> <laughs> Just pray for us. Don't send us money. No, wait. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's not wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> wait, Definitely. what? Send, just send wait, us what? money and we'll pray for you. That's yes. Right. Just send money. Oh, Don't yeah. bother with the prayers. That's how we it got goes. the prayers covered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's go to a quick, prayers are not guaranteed. Quick ad break and then we'll come back for some woo report. If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at kathypress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. We are given one life full of billions of small and large decisions to be somebody, to change, to be kind, to give hope, to become a better person, and to leave a lasting impact on this planet. It is a decision to be made every single day while your heart is still beating. We've made our decision. Absence of clothing. Atheist and science-based apparel and merchandise. Donating 50% of our profits to charity. Look good and feel good without God. Check us out at absenceofclothing.com and find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest for discount codes and other sweet swag. Use the code BRAINSTORM at absenceofclothing.com and get 10% off. The Hardcore Skeptic Examines is a bi-monthly documentary-style podcast that includes interviews, research, and commentary from your host, Corey Johnston. That's me. As the host of the Brainstorm podcast, I've spent the last three-plus years trying to spread critical thinking and skepticism while having fun. This project is intended to look at some of those same topics covered by Brainstorm, but a bit deeper. With the long intervals between episodes and the long format, I'm hoping to provide good information that educates as well as entertains. Check out my Patreon for more details at www.patreon.com slash hardcore skeptic or follow my Twitter at hardcore skeptic. My name is Jonathan Ariola of TDTF Pod. The more voices you hear, the more we observe and feel, the more we learn about the other facets of this complex and wondrous beast that is humanism and free thought. Join me on the science-loving journey through topics like justice, murder, family, diligence, taste, history, society, race, boob jobs, law, addiction, video games, fear, sacrifice, children. Wait, not sacrificing children. That's that's not what I mean. Bring the popcorn and watch me break down the issues too deep, too fast. Join me at TDTF Pod. I'm Jonathan Ariola. Talk to you soon. <laughs> we're back. How we long were ready. have we been back? <laughs> we're here. Wait, what? Don't leave. Please don't leave. <laughs> Shit. All right, we're going to. We're professionals. <laughs> we're going to do a woo report. Woo. Woo. I'm not a scientist, but if I can tell you your science sucks, your science really sucks. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. All right, Bassett, what do you got? So we had a really interesting article, as it is common amongst this show here. (laughs) So when it comes to anti-vaxxers, climate change deniers, chemtrails, conspiracy theorists, it seems like there seems, despite the evidence shown, there seems to be a common denial and a common skepticism amongst it, amongst... uh, youths here (laughs) so essentially 4 out of 10 Canadians uh, go ahead and uh, deny that the evidence given right away and a lot of people would initially go ahead especially if uh, skeptics will go ahead and see this as a huge problem right but we can go ahead and see it in other light as where their skeptics are where skeptics are ourselves we can go ahead and be skeptical of sources. We can go ahead and, um, you know, find out flaws within the research studies. We can go ahead and uh, see if there's any other supporting evidence, controversial evidence. And 
you know, at a point here, a lot of people, well, there is a trend of denying climate change, but the articles did mention a point that amongst those four in 10 Canadians, eight out of 10 of those Canadians are willing to go ahead and look at the perspectives of the scientists. So the, that uh, goes and uh, gives us a bigger picture in that we don't necessarily, science doesn't want you to have faith. You know, if, and now I'm strictly defining faith in the sense of that you do not need to have evidence. Right. And, you know, a lot of people may argue that faith and blind faith are two different things. For me, they're the same thing. And the definition of faith is the uh, absence of facts. Right. So when the facts are presented, uh, presented then you have um, just the entire truth there. So the articles, I believe the fundamental point of it was that if we... In a way, we could see it as a good thing that four of these ten Canadians are generally not using faith anymore and just going ahead and uh, being skeptic on whether or not they should accept the uh, accept if there is really climate change or not. Now, get that being said, climate change is fact. I just want to point that out. Facts <laughs> right. need to work here, but it's okay to be skeptical of it if. The conclusion you're reaching is what majority of uh, scientists have already brought out there, mm-hmm. which is that there is a crisis amongst our coming headed our way. Okay. What I find disturbing about that, um, mm-hmm. the four in ten is is expected. The fact that eighty percent of those people are willing to look at evidence that sounds like a good thing, mm-hmm. right? If you take eighty percent of four, you're left with one, roughly. <laughs> So roughly 10% of Canadians are intentionally <laughs> remaining ignorant. About the science. About science. Mm-hmm. 10% of people refuse science. Maybe you are negative. No, that's just, that's just the maths. <laughs> the article did uh, talk about that. You're negative. And the scientists uh, did bring it up that media has a huge negative portrayal on scientists. Right. That we're, scientists are money-hungry cash grabs and uh, you know as most of our as you've, I'm assuming you've talked to most scientists they really want that money too <laughs> <laughs> but truth be told there is such a trend of a negative portrayal you know and true uh, and then we have to ask yourself where does the problem lie is media to be blamed or is the demand for controversial topics that comes from the people to be blamed right it's our where do we find the entertainment in reading an article that already we already agree with? It's like nobody's going to deny all these scientists. You know, the articles that are going to go ahead and provide the views, provo- you know, make the um, establishment uh, carry on their business would be the viewership of the ones that goes against the popular opinion. You know, and let's, uh, let's be honest here. We love debating against people who deny right. climate change. You know, and that's that's sometimes uh, those are the most f- uh, fueling, those are the best thing. But we're, we're necessarily, not necessarily going to go ahead and necessarily talk about climate change over and over again when scientists have keep providing proof of it, right? So when it comes to uh, media, the question uh, becomes, at what point do we start... Um, you know, pointing the fingers to ourselves rather than just CNN, Fox, etc. Well, the problem, I, when I think media, I'm not thinking CNN and Fox. Internet. I think we need to deplatform people like Dr. Oz. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Oh my Phil. God. It would be nice if he just disappeared, wouldn't it? Yeah. And Dr. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. The yeah. doctors. Fucking the doctors, Oprah, the fucking The View. Yeah, Dr. Phil is mm. a meme, though. He's a hilarious meme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, the problem is with all those shows is that they're entertainment masking as information. Right. Yeah. You know, if, if it was just the fact that, you know, it is, it's just entertainment, then that's fine, you know, but. At work, they, we have a TV in the lounge and people flip off the news to watch Dr. Oz. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Sometimes the news is really shitty. Sure. Sure. That's the truth. And, and and it's not always honest, and it's not always true. 
right? Because it depends on the source. But if you're flipping from fucking BBC. <laughs> BBC is factual and boring to this where it's like eat turmeric with this yogurt and it'll cure everything that ails you. you know? Damn right. Oh man, turmeric and yogurt? Oh. <laughs> People are fucking drinking turmeric lots. Hey, no insult. Turmeric's awesome. But yeah, I love turmeric. <laughs> not just mixed into yogurt. No, I even agree. <laughs> mm. So I have a question. Like You be, uh, being at the University of Regina, mm. I've left U of R four years ago. Mm. What uh, what are students' perspectives when it comes to vaccines and climate change? Because when I was in mm. university, people loved denying that stuff, saying the garments, and I was one of them too, a huge conspiracy theorist. Mm. And then you hit adult life and realize, oh my God, what wasted years. <laughs> <laughs> um, from who I've talked to, actually climate change is like very accepted. Um, like the people who denied are kind of like outcasts and you kind of give them strange good strange looks. And <laughs> yeah. As for, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, no, that's yeah, that's shame. good. Oh, no. Yeah. And as for vaccines, you'll you can get the flu shot on campus. Um it's highly recommended, like it's really They don't have they, people protesting the flu shot. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um as far as I'm I can tell it's progressed. What about conspiracies? Yeah, there's those long-haired guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm the talking jo- about? The Joshes. The Joshes. The Joshes. The Joshes. Yeah. Not what the you, Alexes, you, Josh. Though. What you should do is, is start two more clubs. Hmm. One about conspiracies. <laughs> one about anti-vaxxing. Get people to sign up to be anti-vax people. Yeah, and see them. And then you have all their information. <laughs> and then you yeah, can announce right. yeah. yeah yeah but as far as I know like it seems like better like than what you're describing uh, but then again like I, I don't know if, if someone were to say that to me I don't know if I would talk to them too much <laughs> 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 yeah. when my son first went to started going to Connaught school I actually uh, asked the teacher if there was a way to get information to know if there were kids that were not vaccinated at the school. Right. Because as a parent, I should be able to know if there's kids that, are, that might carry rubella or measles. They pose a risk yeah. to your child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because just because my kid's vaccinated doesn't mean he can't get, the, get yeah. it. Yeah, that's right. It's right. not 100% effective. And they said they can't release that information. Mm. Right. I'm like, I've said, I'm not asking for names. I just want to know if there's unvaccinated kids in the school. Right. They say we can't tell you that because of mm. the privacy act. They're most likely would. Yeah, and that yeah. is yes, the conspiracy. Well, even <laughs> there's there's likely one immunosuppressed kid at that school, sure. probably at least. So, but they've actually started to. But he can't have fucking kids. peanut butter. Well, no, fuck no. <laughs> so it's, start- it's it's okay for your kid to kill. Everybody else's kids. Yeah. But it's not okay for my kid to eat a fucking peanut butter sandwich. No, because somebody breathes and fucking dies because they don't have their EpiPen. <laughs> or the EpiPen's not working. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts? Especially without the- turmeric. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think um, millennials... Um, oh, I just had to blame the millennials. <laughs> no, 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 no. God no. damn millennials. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of negative context about... Yeah, you know I'm technically a millennial too. It's just don't yeah. let the hair fool you. <laughs> it's uh, there's a lot of negative context of us, but you, you know you have to. Uh, I think a lot of people have to understand. There's like we're young. There's a lot of stupidity there, of course, and there's a lot of uh, um, time to grow. Right. Yeah, that's how I see it as. Yeah, almost I mean, everything that people are blaming boomers for, or millennials for. It's actually the fault of the boomers. Yeah, yeah. It's like when they say, they say participation trophy, all you care about, you get the participation trophy. You're like, I didn't make up the participation trophy. That exactly. was my parents who did that. Eh? Yeah. And why don't you try? I, fucking love I can't buy a trophy. fucking house. <laughs> yeah. What's the point? Yeah, the house. Is that okay? You know that's another topic. But okay, hey. so there's room to grow. That's, yeah, that's, that's what we're leaving that Thank topic. So, <laughs> join us next time for millennials. All right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do the uh, what the fuck, and then Renee can start. What the fuck? Fucking what the fucking fuck? Who the fuck? Fuck this fucking... How did you do fucking fucks? Fuck! Wait, wait. 
Certainly illustrates the diversity of the work. <laughs> Okay, uh, I found this article on Vice, which uh, <laughs> I love. Legit, it. super legit. Vice is awesome. They find the weirdest shit. It's awesome. But um, what they did was they went to uh, Bulgaria to check out uh, a bride market. So what? How uh, was that? What's that? How was that? Uh, apparently interesting. Uh, I guess what it is is that there's. Um, I, I'm not even going to try to say the name. There's a, a sub-clan of Roma people living um, in Bulgaria. Okay. So Roma or gypsies. We'll just call them the Joshes. The Joshes. <laughs> yeah. Josh. No, that's definitely the guys that are at the bride market. <laughs> the traveling Joshes. Oh, you, Josh. man. They, like, they, ooh, they were douchey. But uh-huh. at any rate, uh, so what they do is they still have this... Um, this Well, this old tradition of... Kind of a bride wealth where, you know, you're, it's, you know, dowry, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And what they've done now is they have this once a year where they get all the girls dolled up that are of marriage age, which is apparently from ages 13 up to 20, though the one girl they were talking to is 25, which they said was basically a spinster. Yeah. For for this group in Elizabethan times, that yeah. was like nineteen. And they and they take them to this bride market, and it's one of the rare ki- times when they can mingle with the opposite sex. And they, if there's some sparks flying, that's when the parents then negotiate a price for their daughter to marry them. Wow! And it's it was it was one of those things where it sounds so backwards, but it was it was interesting was because. When they're talking to the girls, they're participating, but they kind of don't want to. And they've figured out little ways or sort of ways around it. Because, like, they're not allowed to meet with boys outside the home. They're severely chaperoned because it's still pretty old school where, you know, girls have to be virginal and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. But through Facebook, you know, they, you know, they were showing, they were showing some of the guys that they were interested in to the reporter and... You know, there's there's ways around it. And then when they were actually at the bride market, they were talking to some of the guys and they're just like, you know, do you do you like this? Are you you know, do you like this bride market? And they're, most of them are like, not really, but it's tradition. We have kind of feel like we have to do it. Mm-hmm. So and and the other aspect of it, which is kind of weird, but it kind of makes sense, was that part of this is that for the most part, this um, Roma clan ma- made their money off of. They're coppersmiths. That's actually what their clan name translates into. Okay. And because of... Doesn't well, get more gypsy than that. Yeah. And uh, because of globalization, cheaper products from China, they're losing that. And so this is almost uh, this is almost like a income... Supplement. You know, supplement, yeah. Really? You know. You know, like, and it so was, what percentage does a house keep? I have no <laughs> idea. Like it's it's really it's really it's negotiated between parents. Is it Once, a growth market or? Yeah, you know, you're, you're bringing economics into a medieval system. <laughs> Those are good questions. I'm sure Weiss wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and, so, and it was it was kind of an interesting it was an interesting look at you know you know they were talking about how what you know how the girls had to look and you know what they had to present like they're all putting on pomade because. You know, the parents of the boys, would they be looking for girls with, you know, you know, very light skin and blue eyes and they had to be well dressed and all this kind of stuff. You know, it was it was just that it was it was kind of a weird thing to see a relatively like Bulgaria, you know, it's it's still a modern European country, but still Mm -hmm. they have these pockets like the Romas are very um, uh, repressed minority in Europe, but. It was, it was like 18,000 people at this thing. Mm-hmm. Like, it was oh, huge. Wow. And there's, it, there's still, they were all there with the, with the phones and Facebook. And it was very modern, but yet they're doing this very old traditional thing. Like, yeah. it, was, it was kind of a, it was, it was interesting and yet kind of weird and backward. It's kind of mm-hmm. a, t- a t-shirt stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Went yeah. to buy a wife and all I got was this crummy t-shirt. Yeah. Yes. So what's the... Do you know what the legal age of consent is in Bulgaria? No, they didn't go into that. They didn't yeah. go into that. Like they just said that the average age is that they were, you know, mm-hmm. try to marry the girls' office between thirteen and 
20 to 25. I don't think they worry about consent. Yeah. Areas and like, and the weird thing is, I guess when you're talking about selling your daughters, it's not really a, <laughs> not a big deal. It's kind of a weird <laughs> thing. Was like, yeah, they're selling them, but they're n- not. But it's the daughters that are paying, <laughs> right? You know, well, if there's a bride fair. price, yeah. Like, I mean, they're they're negotiate, they're haggling basically, and like they're <laughs> <laughs> like nothing it, makes it sound good. No, there's no way to spin <laughs> yeah. it. But like, other than other than to say, there is some change of the attitudes because like. Uh, the 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 family they were interviewing, the mother was yeah she had no choice. You know, it was to to their to their father was it was just boom her parents made a deal with his, his parents and done. That was that. That was done. And they said oh well, eventually they grew to love each other and everything. It was oh, a, like any traditional arranged marriage, but yeah. But <laughs> thing is, but the, but these parents like were making sure that the girls they were waiting until they made sure they made a good match. Right. So there was some change in in the tradition, but they're still doing the tradition. So, you know, let's kind of look, bring it to our society here. Let's look at a wedding, for example. Well, you the got, thing is, is they do do that. Like, have you ever heard of the surprise surprise on TLC? A big fat <laughs> gypsy wedding? Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Similar. It's a similar culture where, it's, you know, mm-hmm. they get married super young, uh, but they have these, out- they spend these outrageous Amounts of money on these, like just gaudy, yeah. goofy dresses and weddings. Cheesy. Like, we, well, yeah. like yeah. any any yeah. wedding in general. Like if you think about it, you have like high tech uh, devices there. Everything has a modern feel to it. But you know, you ask yourself, well, why are you doing this? Like it's so such a no. Uh, oh, the arcade. Arcade. <laughs> But yeah, you know, what I was thinking that yeah. when I was watching this video, it's like it's we still have some of these goofy things. Like we exactly. we talk about how terrible this is, and it, it's it's terrible. Yeah. And, you know, the sanctity of marriage and stuff like that. But yet we also have fucking marriage game shows like The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't remember yes. which comedian it was, but it was, uh, yeah, marriage. It's the stupidest thing. It's, uh, wow, I loved you so much. I want to get the government involved. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's what it is. Well, because they, they have to give you that legally Take binding. it from the divorced guy. Marriage yeah. is stupid. Mm. <laughs> I'm married. And, you know. That money. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. No disagreement. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, that's the thing. In is hindsight, like we say- it probably shouldn't have gotten married. It should have just, you know, <laughs> stayed shacked up. <laughs> my marriage, my my wedding costs like eight hundred bucks. We're eloping. That's basically what we see. Did. And that's yeah. just it. Is some people do that, and other people they're so. St- Set on that traditional wedding that they'll they'll spend like yeah I'm the one that gives them bank loans <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe someday it would be uh, interesting to spend some time talking about weddings and some of the weird dynamics that go on there. not even just weddings but any any of those yeah kind like of things because the, the idea of the father giving away the bride and like there's some the daughter saving herself for her father yeah, like, for her some, father no for her husband no 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 no, no, no. like the father owns her virginity and oh, then yeah. gives her permission to yeah. lose it to the husband well there's there's a lot of there's a lot of weird <laughs> yeah, yeah. dynamics that go on yeah. you know uh, you know to have in some anthropology there's you know, there's a lot of weird shit you can take out of like oh, our yeah. modern marriage. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, it's, very, it's weird. It's really weird shit. The very creepy. Uh, well, now the father daughter dance is always accompanied by like some weird country song that talks uh, about uh, the daughter as though she's in a relationship with her dad. And yes, like, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's just here. Strange. That's the sketch one. I think that's the sketch one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The wedding I was at like, at the beginning of the month was, I was had all to, of those uh, things. George Robb uh, of the Geologic Podcast down in the States, he did like a parody of these songs because there's so many of these songs yeah. that it's are so very right. like it's it's I don't know, it's it, something that doesn't just Saskatchewan people not only Saskatchewan but people know. Like all of this was what I was kind of going through my head as I was watching this because like as I was watching, going okay, this is interesting, kind of fucked up, but interesting. And I can already hear people just going, oh, my God, that's so fucking backward. And I'm like, it is, but it isn't. Is it different than what we do? Well, like, yeah. well the, the reasoning for the maid of honor is just be there to, to guarantee the, ma- the, the, the bride's honor. Well, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that's very, like, think, you think about it. You She's have, legit. The and, is well, you think about the, oh, what, what's the best. The man? eagle has not landed. <laughs> the best man and the groomsman are there, Cherry so someone doesn't kidnap the bride. Right. 
you know, like, these are all really weird fucking holdover traditions that I don't think most people even realize, but they just know that they have to have a best man, they have to have exactly. four groomsmen, and, yeah. you know. And like, Some and people just like to have parties and make shit out of paper. And, but but even glitter. And do you Pinterest. know the, the history of engagement rings? They were originally given, um, like if uh, to kind of like show. Uh, what was it? Is it ownership? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I'm trying. I'm blanking on how it was worded. The thing was, is engagement rings haven't been around that long. Yeah. Yeah, it was like in the like I don't know late eighteen hundreds and stuff like that. No, I think it was later than that. Mm. I don't remember. Like, and it was a There's diamond a- company that was suggested that you should use ten percent of your annual salary. That was yeah. That was an ad campaign. Yeah, Did you guys like watch the, Adam, Ruins Adam, Adam Ruins. Yeah, yeah. Adam's Ruins. <laughs> yeah, Adam's Ruins. Yeah. But you know, but that but that's just it. Is like we all like. We can we can shit all it. over we can shit all over this you just, tradition. I lo- just like I love that diamond the, the comedian about diamonds. Uh, their their hats have always been really good. Uh, diamonds are forever. Yeah. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Moist now they've got to the forever. point where they're getting a little more honest with their advertising. Diamonds it'll take her breath away. Next it's going to be diamond. That'll shut her up. <laughs> <laughs> Diamond, it'll take you six months to pay for. Yeah. <laughs> that's, but, that, but that's just what I mean. It's like we shit all over this, but yet w- there are some women, and I've, I've heard them say it, where they're talking about engagement ring, and no, it's got to be at least three months' yes. salary. Yeah, that's right. You know, Dumb. You know, I, like, I mean, all I said was I don't want fucking yellow gold. And, <laughs> right. And I don't want a big you know, but that's rock. A, But that's just what I, but it, that's what I mean. It's like we shit all over this because it's kind of weird yeah. but how many of our own our own cultural things are really fucking weird mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. starting to sound like a postmodernist. ah oh, shit <laughs> <laughs> better start growing that hair back out <laughs> uh, no nah, it's gone it's gone man it's I, gone I feel you I feel it's you it's gone <laughs> alright I'm gonna I like the fact that I'm the oldest guy here and I've got the most hair what's whatever your man what's your secret <laughs> door hats uh-huh. I, I, never, I never, I never wore, wore hats. hats. Yeah. <laughs> See, so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I got my mom's uh, dad's genetics. Your mom's dad's genetics. Yeah, the guy man. Wa- he went, but thing he went bald at sixty. You got your mom and your dad's genetics. No, my mom's has nice thick hair. No, no. I met my mom's dad. My grandpa's genetics. Mm-hmm. He went bald said- at sixty. The only one in my family too, and I somehow got that. Mm. Okay, look. I'm gonna, any any last thoughts? No, it was just an Don't interesting buy article. Thirteen year old bride, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm gonna let's do some uh, listener feedback first. Edwin uh, messaged me about our interview with Matt Dillahunty, and missed. he said, "Good work. I think you missed a couple of key points that you could have brought up in your debate. It wasn't so much a debate, but yeah, uh, Matt." Said, I'll worry about real, I'll worry about neo Nazis when they have real power. And uh, he says, they do. <laughs> like, Trump is in the White House. <laughs> this, is, this is a genuine concern. Steve um, Bannerman, man. <laughs> Steve, fuck, fuck well, you. he's out now. No, he still has power. Yeah, well, that's right, true. Bart. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he, uh, Edwin says he would have also pushed back a bit on what he feels was a dismissal of the sociological definition of racism, which Matt didn't really accurately give or represent and kind of just glossed over. And that's those are both fair. Uh, I kind of felt that there was some points where I disagreed with what Matt said, but I didn't... He kind of just kept going, and I just kind of wanted to listen to everything he was saying. And, I mean... I still, as much as I decry the idea of heroes in the atheist movement, I still kind of hold Matt on a pedestal. And he's a really nice guy, and he's a, yeah, you know, he does. He doesn't usually trip over his own ego. No, so so it's it's. I mean, there's a few things that I disagreed with him on. There's a few things that apparent are that Edwin disagreed with him on, and and that's fine. It's just. It was, he's uh, not God. He's not perfect. <laughs> he's a, a regular dude. Yeah. Well, and, and you guys are in the same community because he's an atheist and you're an atheist. 
You can have different views on other things. Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter. He's not infallible. Nope, he is not <laughs> infallible. <laughs> Uh, we got Randy LaMonda said on Twitter that he loved the discussion, though. It was awesome. So Thanks, Randy. Thanks to Edwin and Randy for the feedback. Yes. Patreon. We have no new patrons. Uh, I want to give a, a shout-out to our top patrons, Lisa, Positively Skeptical, and Rob Geiger. Uh, thanks for being part of the Brainstorm, Brainstorm Skeptical Club. Uh, you can get free you can get access to tons of extra content that nobody else gets including exclusive content that apparently i'm the only one who tries to get out every month for five dollar and up patrons and uh, what do you guys think of a patron hangout like on google's Google's, that might be fun. The Googles? Mm -hmm. The Googles? Yeah, yeah. We could do a, like a Google group. Why don't you do that as a bonus content? Yeah, just a bonus, like have patrons come and sure. chat with us. Why don't we just open up bonus content for any from now on? Just have it sitting there open if they want to come on. You would have to know ahead of time, but. Yeah, sure. no, if, uh, I don't think Positively Skeptical will ever be a. Be, here. It's still your Patreon name, though. I know, but I'm already here, so I can't be here as my Patreon <laughs> if I'm already here. <laughs> Just set him up well, in another room. He has to run back and forth. Well, well but we, we could let all the patrons. We we have a, whole, a total of 12 patrons. I'm sure we could do a Google Hangout and just they could be in the chat room and we could talk to them if we could figure out a scheduling issue. That would be cool. So iTunes reviews and Facebook reviews. We have none, no new ones. But I, I really need our listeners to do this. Uh, Chris from the Podong Polymath podcast has 20 reviews, and we only have eight. We've been running for th three years longer than he has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's get some reviews going. Uh, something nice would be nice. Uh, five out of five, guys. Five out mm -hmm. of five stars. That would be cool. <laughs> And we're on a bit of a downswing for listeners, patrons, and feedback. So if you want to share the show, share it on Twitter, Facebook, write a review. Just don't share it on your Patreon without asking us. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that was an argument Corey and I had a while charge, ago. Don't charge your patrons for our show. <laughs> <laughs> we're up to 919 likes on the Facebook page, though. And if we get to 1,000, mm. I have three brainstorm hand embroidered ball caps that I can give away. If people want them, he's been wearing them for three years. No, no, no. Vintage Corey sweat. They're, they're tucked did you say hand embroidered? Hand like, embroidered. Like, did you do it? No. Because that would look like crap. But a professional person did this. Embroiderer. <laughs> oh, a professional embroiderer. Like a professional person. It could have been like a plumber. Okay. We got to get through this fast. Well, hurry up. Who needs to plug stuff? Angela was. Possibly doing a thing. I talked to Wendy Marsman of the Women Beyond Belief podcast, and uh, she suggested we publish our conversation. And I said, "Okay, as long as we don't name names." Uh, so she cut all the all the, the names the names out. <laughs> so oh, we're gonna. So we're not even gonna know who she know who she was talking shit about. It was Josh. It was definitely yeah. Gumby. It was definitely <laughs> Gumby. <laughs> I thought that everything went well. <laughs> I have uh, an interview with Peter Coffin that I just put out on my Hardcore Skeptic uh, show. Sweet. And let's cue that outro music. Did you say she's going to publish it? Good night, everyone. <laughs> I think that's Thanks everything. Thanks for listening. You can check out the show notes at thebrainstormpodcast.com and our website, brainstormblog.net. Thanks to our financial supporters, Aaron, Daryl, Destin. Oh, no. Aaron, Daryl, Destin sucks. Yeah. Lachlan, oh, <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> Magnus. That's actually Alden. Uh, Michael, Nathan, Positively Skeptical, Rob, Stephanie, and Will. If you want to join their ranks and help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstorm podcast. Join us live every Alden's second Magnus? week. No, Alden is Destin sucks. Oh, okay. That's, that's yes. <laughs> Fuck you, Alden. <laughs> you can join us live every second week when we broadcast live on Spreaker. You can find us at Spreaker.com slash user slash Brainstorm Podcast. Next guest is Jonathan Ariola for the TDTF pod. 
Thanks, Deborah, for joining us. You can find out more about her podcast at speaker.com slash show slash beyond dash the dash trailer dash park dash AOA or by Googling Beyond the Trailer Park Podcast. I'll put a link to her YouTube as well in the show notes. Oh, thank you, Idella, for coming on the show. Thanks. Um, yeah, we already will. I'll add a e- the email to the SSA at the U of R in our show notes. Thanks to Dave for our intro music. Thanks to Alex Kepper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for the intro and some of our ads. Thanks to, Jason, thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find his stuff at lostdatamind.com. All music played is either with permission or under the SOCAN license to play. For more information on SOCAN, you can check out the music's license info page on our website, brainstormblog.net. Live listeners, you can go to the after show at mixler.com slash the dash brainstorm dash podcast and listen to the bonus content before it goes to patron only. Sometimes the after show is the best content we do. Sometimes. (laughs) So so if you want to listen to it without having to be a patron, then uh, stay tuned or go over to Mixler.com, I mean, and uh, check it out. Thanks for listening. And remember, the truth matters. is an opinion-based podcast. Each person on the podcast is responsible for their own opinions, and those opinions don't necessarily reflect the views of the rest of the panel. Any guests or anyone associated with the people on the podcast, such as spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, or employers. No one person speaks for the podcast with the possible exception of Corey, and he doesn't speak for anyone else on the show. The Brainstorm podcast does not represent the views of our sponsors. We just wanted to say thanks to everyone who listens to us, shares the show, gives us a rating on iTunes or Stitcher, or supports us through Patreon and Gumroad. We don't have a lot of interactions with our listeners, but what we have had proves that we attract some of the best people around. Smart, kind, and cool. An audience truly worthy of the titles Hardcore and Woo Free. Thanks for helping us make the world a smarter place. It's still not Rage Against the Machine. It isn't, but it's got its own style. I love it.